I'm Paul Batty, Chief Executive of Hoffman Reed, and I'd like to thank you for listening to season two of our podcast, Lessons in Leadership. Over the season, I will interview talented leaders from across the globe about everything from their daily routine to their toughest career challenges. Please note that these podcasts are normally recorded four to six weeks before publication. If you enjoy the show, then please subscribe to receive the latest episodes as they are released. I hope you enjoy. So today on our Lessons in Leadership podcast, we have Nirpini Mabunda, Chief Executive of Southern Africa for GE. He's also Chair of the US South Africa Business Council at the US Chamber of Commerce. Nirpini, it's great to have you on the show with us today. Thank you so much, Paul, and thanks for inviting me. Um, so the first question I ask everybody is, could you give us a quick overview of your career and how you've ended up in the role you are today? Um, a number of our listeners are, um, are, are hopeful that one day they will make it to the C-suite and the chief exec role. Um, so it would be useful for those individuals to, to learn a little bit about how you've got to where you are. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it took me about, what, um, 17, 18 years to get to my first CEO role. I started my career as a commercial graduate trainee with Procter & Gamble, um, so in sales. Um, did that for five years. I was recruited into DIG, um, where I stayed 15 years. I did various roles in marketing, strategy, and that's when I got my first um, general management or CEO role in Uganda. That was in 2013. Um, so yeah, about 17 years later. And, uh, and then from there, I was recruited into Vodafone, uh, into a divisional CEO role for consumer. And then um, from Vodafone, I came to my current role as GE CEO for Southern Africa. And when I reflect back, in terms of lessons in that, I think there's a couple of things. I think one is uh, I was quite clear earlier on about my ambition in terms of my general management. And secondly, I then um, uh, built relationships deliberately with uh, people who have walked my path for guidance and their mentorship and observed them in action. Um, then thirdly, I took risks. Um, you know, so I um, allowed myself to do things that were a little bit different and uncomfortable for that uniqueness to show. And I think lastly, um, I kept on growing myself. So every opportunity to do additional assignments, broadening assignments, um, take on extra stuff um, to learn, but also to be visible was quite useful. Um, I did say lastly, but actually there was one more thing. Um, certainly having worked for multinationals, um, throughout my career, GE, Vodafone, Procter & Gamble, and Diageo, I opened myself up for international moves. So while I am South African, I have worked seven years outside of South Africa, in the UK for four years, as well as in Uganda for three years. And that just broadened my perspective. So I think by and large, those are the things that helped me to get to where I am. Yeah, I think a lot of the international executives we speak to on this show say the same thing that working in another country it really broadens their horizon and, and makes them think differently about about culture and, and and how you get the best out of people what would you say have been the real sort of highlights for you of, of working overseas and and how has that impacted your leadership style yeah um it's, it's a great one i think in uganda in particular for me the highlight has just been being comfortable with being uncomfortable, you know, so um, really walking into quite a challenging environment um, from a culture point of view, infrastructure point of view, the politics of the, of the country itself. I mean, Uganda has had the same leader for three decades, you know, and, um, and, and, and into a, a, a high growth but small economy and therefore didn't have the same priority within the Diageo uh, business as a South African, for example. So as, a, as, as, a, as someone who aspired to bigger things, you can get lost in an environment like that. But um, what, what has been quite useful for me is um, 
is just the agility and adaptability and how you build relationships very quickly. So in an environment where you're not known and you don't understand the culture, it's about how do you actually fit in and be able to be influential. And mind you, the expats, expatriate life is that you get a three, three or four year contract, so you don't have much time. So you have to do things very quickly and learn with impact. So, so I think for me that that has been great in terms of how do you build networks very quickly? How do you build relationships very quickly? How do you adapt your style to fit the situation? I found myself, especially because of the talent environment um, in the country, I found myself uh, being a lot more operational than what I was in a, in a, in a talent rich country, very much in the, in, on the ground. Um, I found myself being very much um, 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 in, 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 you know, engaging with the regulators. And, and I got a lot of wins through that from an, an innovation point of view. But I think one of the other things that was very useful was um, how, because of the size of the business, I'd been out of spotlight of, 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 the, of a big operation. I was able to do things very quickly, uh, very agile. I didn't have to get the same level of red tape and approvals that you would get in a bigger country. So, so it, 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 it taught me to be a lot more independent. Um, so a lot of my innovations and growth was with local brands, for example. And yet up until that time, I was working on big global brands. You imagine the brands that a Prop 10 Gamble or a Diageo would have your top seven. But when I got to Uganda, 65% of my revenue came from Ugandan only brands. So I didn't have reliance on global innovation or anything. I had to be creative and do things. And those lessons actually accelerated my growth um, by and large. Now, when I think about the UK, um, as an example, it was a completely different dynamic because now suddenly I could not hide by being in the market where I could only be seen once a quarter or once every two months when the bosses from London comes to visit. Now I was in a global head office, you know, and, and therefore I was under the spotlight. I was seeing what's going on, but, but it was very important because I was then able to appreciate the full scale and scope of the business and resources that were available to me. And I was able to leverage the fact that if I wanted anything, I just go upstairs. I meet someone in the, in the restaurant, we have a meal and then we talk. And then and, and coaching and mentorship was very important because I was surrounded by highly, highly talented uh, leaders in the global head office of DIJ and I could access them and I could just ask to have lunch with them and they would impart their knowledge. So I think it's about uh, taking the best of what you have access to and make it work and then be very adaptable and learn very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There must have been some quite tough periods as well during that uh that time working away from home in, in different countries what what do you do to get through the toughest periods and and how do you find that that balance to to to, to create that space between work and and home yeah no yeah for sure you're absolutely right and and, and i experienced one of the many stories that expatriates do get uh, which is the ability of the family to settle so my wife um, had, for instance, to quit her job and, and she was a professional in South Africa to become a stay-at-home mom, which was very uncomfortable for her. And then obviously the social network of friends and so on. So that, that, that was quite um, tough. And, and the challenge in Uganda was more social, where we didn't have friends, we didn't have much to do because the country doesn't have as much infrastructure and development of entertainment options or the options as a London where we had come from, or South Africa, where we had lived. And, and that can make it very, very challenging. But I, what I learned is an, um, to have outlet for stress and energy management. Um, so, you know, I found myself playing golf, for example, and I'm not a big golfer, but I learned golf anyway, because it, it just clears my head on Saturdays. Um, I find personally from an energy management point of view, just diverting your attention into exercise. Right now, I'm like an avid cyclist. Uh, you know, I do about 200 kilometers a week. And yeah, just wow. when I'm there, I, I have the freedom of the skies, as I call it, and, 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 and I just come back very fresh. So, so I think it is, it is about finding something that can divert your attention and your energy, and you can look forward to 
and you reset. You know, um, I used to get out of the country a little bit now and then and just fly somewhere weekend away, recharge, recharge, rest, and uh, because it is hard, hard work being out there. I think the other thing is knowing that there's an end in mind because you are working towards something, but what, but being driven by the feeling of that achievement to say, after this, what could happen? So I think because I'm quite ambitious, I'm driven by goals. For me, I was very much occupied by what I need to deliver, knowing that every road has got speed bumps on it, you know, and, and just inter interpreting the challenges as a speed bump rather than a, a wall that is just stopping me and, and therefore re recalibrating that. And, and I think lastly, it, it's just the, 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 the reminder to ourselves that the challenges that we face in leadership are not unique to us, um, you know, and there's many people who have overcome such challenges, if not bigger, and, and, and therefore if they could do it, so can you. And if you're not sure that you can do it, then ask them how they did it. You know, many people are very much prepared to coach and mentor, and it's just to reach out. There's a lot of resources even within the organization, and we just need to be proactive and use that. Mm -hmm. Which brings me nicely into how do you evaluate yourself as a leader? Um, because I think we, yeah. as leaders, we all, we all have a job to do, and we all see the goal, and, and sometimes, you know, it, it's hard to evaluate what we actually do ourselves. How, how do you go about doing that? I think, um, I, I, I guess maybe it's because I grew up in commercial roles, but I love benchmarking. And I've always said uh, the best measure, one of the best measure for performance is not what is in my KPIs or my performance review with my chairman or my manager and whatever. It's actually um, relative performance to my competitors. Am I winning market share profitably or not? And therefore, for me, I evaluate myself by the performance of my peers and my peer companies. I benchmark. I benchmark my revenue growth, my profit growth, my margins, all of those kind of things. Because at the end of the day, um, especially in the listed space, I'm competing for investment and return to my shareholder with other alternative uh, companies that they can put their money into. And I want them to put it in mind. And therefore I have to either perform within the, my peer, my peers or above my peers in terms of total shareholder return. So, 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 so I, I always make sure I know my competitors, I know my market and, and, and I read what they do and how they're performing. So that's kind of number one, because I think the market doesn't lie. Uh, I say, I say, if I achieve my internal goals and I have lost five points market share, that's still not good enough. So obviously it's also formally, I, I, I'm always aware of what I need to achieve. I break down my goals into weekly or bi-weekly basis. So I'm very clear about the cadence. Um, so at the beginning of each week, uh, because I'm very much task oriented, what is it that I need to deliver this week? And then the beginning of the following week, I look back and say, how does that, how, how have I done against that? And I tend to be stricter or tougher or more stretchy in my own evaluation versus my formal evaluation. So there's an element of stretch and, and I, uh, I always know, but also, um, you know, lastly, it's also about, um, am I growing? Am I growing myself? Am I growing people? So, so, so at some point, if I feel like I'm not on a learning and it's not on my exciting, then maybe I'm either not doing a, doing a good job or I'm not stretching myself enough. But, but I, I always know where I need to go and I, I evaluate myself against that path that I've set for my career together with an external path. And I know you mentioned before, uh, before we started recording the show that you're currently doing a, a course with INSEAD and, you know, uh, I guess that professional development and that professional education is is another way of challenging yourself as well. Oh yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so if I give you an example, Paul, of the, the course that I'm doing now, uh, which is the AMP um, Advanced Management Program, and and the professors were very much at pain to explain that that's a historic name, it's supposed to be Advanced Leadership Program, uh, because of kind of what it is. The beauty about it is that I'm surrounded by other senior executives and mostly CEOs as well. 
and um, and we're dealing with some issues, especially right now uh, with the pandemic around the world. But we, we there's 18 nationalities, and um, and with those 18 nationalities and and about in a class of 40, we've got about 28 CEOs, and and you're able to benchmark and see where you are based on you know of course your own class participation your own inputs, quality of your interventions. And of course, you, you break into smaller groups of four or five and you have a conversation and you learn from each other. And, and I find that quite useful. So, you know, if you've been honest with yourself and you're self-aware, which is very, very important, um, uh, you know, to get feedback and be self-aware, then you will know where you are versus your peers. And, and therefore, if you're growth-oriented like me, then you challenge yourself to get to a certain level or you accept that this is kind of where I am, but you would have a relative link. And you mentioned something there in your, your answer where you talked about challenges and, and the pandemic and how everybody's uh, business has been challenged at the moment. How has COVID affected your organization and, and how have you gone about overcoming some of the challenges? Yeah, look, it's, um, it's affected it in a, a, a different uh, ways. I think um, if you take our three businesses, um, power and energy, of course, worldwide, and we've seen in South Africa, a lot of the, the you know, GE generate a third of global electricity. In South Africa, it's more than uh, 70% of the local electricity. So, of course, the big challenge has been the reduction in demand. Um, as, 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 as offices closed and uh, operations shut down um, at the early, early years, we've seen what manufacturing output has done. So, so that reduction in demand means that there's less services, you postpone orders of stuff and so on and so forth. So, so, but on the other hand, what we've seen is that there's an increase in demand for renewable energy worldwide, a significant increase. And that has also been brought forward uh, because many governments realize that investing in infrastructure is, is, a, is a very good way to revive and stimulate economic activity. So that, that, so that has been mixed for us in power, um, reduction on one hand, but a huge increase on the other, which we're quite excited for the future. Healthcare has also been the same. Some services like elective services, um, elective procedures have, have been reduced because hospitals are full of um, uh, COVID, COVID patients, and therefore you, you can't do elective operations and you've got big machinery in there. But on the other hand, COVID-related treatment um, have increased drastically, and we do make ventilators, we do make patient monitors, and so on. So that has balanced itself out. Um, and that has been great, um, and it's out in the public space if you look at the global results of GE. The biggest hit for us, which is a huge challenge, is aviation. Because GE has got about 60% um, market share of all commercial jet engines. So whether you fly in Airbus or Boeing or any other uh, airframe, or which we, we well, you know, whether it's BA, KLM, Emirates, and whoever, you're likely to be flying um, uh, a GE engine and more than half the time. And of course, those 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 aircrafts have been grounded by and large. Because, I mean, um, worldwide, we only operate at about 50% of the capacity. And there's question marks about the future, whether we'll continue to meet like this um, in replacement of face-to-face, -face, meaning that we're not flying to meet, or uh, whether after everyone, the world is vaccinated, um, uh, flight will return to what it used to be. So that business um, has been an exciting and a very difficult challenge um, for us. But again, the principles for me, have been the same. A couple of things. Um, you're not alone in this. So if you take aviation, we are affected the same way that Heathrow management um, or the airport operators are, the same way that the frame manufacturers, Airbus and Boeing are, and the same way that uh, pilots associations would be. So get together, put your heads together because you're in the same situation and share ideas. You know, you're not competing. It's all about the industry. Secondly, there's a bigger um, a challenge in there in terms of it, it, it affects big industries like cargo. How do you transport goods going forward? It affects big industries like tourism. And therefore, you can engage the government and become very, very creative 
around how you get about it. Because when you take that, that challenge and you frame it in a bigger way, then you're bringing in more brain power, more resources in finding the solutions. And more importantly, you also get closer in terms of the relationship. I think one of the big opportunities for business, especially in, in emerging markets, is government and private sector working closer together um, um, to find solutions. And I find that this pandemic, in a way, has really brought us closer um, to, 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 to the ecosystem in business, but more importantly, to the regulators. Um, and, and many times we've been on the opposite scale. And, and then the other one is, is about being agile and innovative. And this, this example has happened in the UK, actually, where, for example, we got orders um, in, for ventilators to be supplied in, in one month, which was more than what we've supplied in five years. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. that's what pandemic did. And, and how do you solve that? How do you suddenly come up with a, a, a five year supply in one month? And you know what the team in the UK did is just like fantastic. They retrained the stuff that, that was uh, fixing jet engines that were idle to now make ventilators. And they converted the hangar where we fix aircraft because now the aircraft were not being fixed to a makeshift ventilator factory. And suddenly those people were now employed on very clear post. And then obviously because you're making all of these decisions, then you then, then you challenge the process of making ventilators and say, can this be done differently? What 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 part of the process were, were we just too used to that we can disrupt? And no, we were able to supply those ventilators in a month. But more importantly is that we're able to then change the process of making quality ventilators for good. That saved us. Um, out of the whole process, 45% of the manufacturing time. Mm -hmm. So in crisis, you make a plan and that plan improves it for good. And, and I think lastly, it's just the realization that our people in general have got a lot, are, are a lot more resourceful than what we give them credit for. And how do we then create a culture of problem solving um, across the organization of taking risks and of allowing people to show up. So those are some of the things that I've learned um, in, in, in COVID. But I, I think like many other uh, businesses would relate to the power of digitalization. Um, you know, um, it's a learning that I think many people in my space uh, have gotten in terms of how much more you can achieve if, you, if it's enabled by technology. You just allow, and uh, because I think SC has been too conservative too afraid to go into unknown. Um, and we've been forced uh, into rapid digitalization. And the benefits are, are, are huge. And, 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 and we're generating so much more data. And as we go forward, I'm, I can't help but think about what opportunities is this going to open up for us in the post-COVID post world? Uh, from an analytic point of view, from a personalization point of view, uh, from a speed and efficiency point of view. The kind of data we collect in is something else. Okay. And if we come back to your sort of leadership style, how, how do you know personally when your leadership style is becoming less effective? I think great leaders have got good followership and impact. And I think for me, the acid test is the engagement of my team and my people. I'm a big believer in high performing and high engaged, highly engaged teams. And I know that many organizations do net promoter scores, mm -hmm. um, an annual survey, engagement survey, how likely are people to leave or recommend their employer to someone else and so on. Um, I do think that those surveys, um, especially when they have response rates in an organization above 80% are quite useful. And I follow that very, very carefully um, to say, are your employees engaged? Do they, do they align to the strategy and the vision of the organization? And, excuse me, and are they loyal? And, and to the extent that that continues to grow, then I know I'm being effective as a leader. 
But once there's a disconnect between where I'm going as a leader versus my exact team, there's no alignment or versus the general staff, then I have to be true to myself and look in the mirror and self-assess. You know, that's, that's kind of the first sign. The, the other one, though, is, is, is also about performance, right? If, 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 if I really know that, that we are chasing the right things strategy-wise, um, so there's no issue on the strategy and we're well positioned, but we are not delivering and we are losing to our competitors, then, you know, I, I have to take it on the chin because I am being put there to drive shareholder returns to drive impact, to drive business results. And if those business results are not coming, I can have one bad year, maybe, maybe one and a half. But if I'm consistently not having great, uh, good years, I need to look in the mirror and call it before my chairman comes and say, Indeed, it's time for us to have a conversation, <laughs> you know? But I think if you are being effective as a leader, you've got to be delivering results. Mm -hmm. so, so for me, there are two things. Do I have followership or engaged him? And am I delivering results? And I guess last one is just my own emotion and where I am. Am I still having fun? Do I still believe in the cause? And uh, because I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm quite a high energy, passionate leader and I love enjoying what I'm doing. And if it starts to become a drag, then, you know, unless I'm happy and, and feeling good about what I'm doing, then I cannot be effective. You know, you, 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 you certain things you can't fake. <laughs> you know, I've got to feel it and know that it's happening. And then I project it out, out uh, externally. Um, so, so I guess those are, those are some uh, three, three signs for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting point there around energy and enjoyment. If, if you're not enjoying it, um, how can you inspire your people to enjoy it yeah. and, and perform? Um, so I think there's, there's always a piece there of, of, of being self-aware enough to understand when it's also time to, to, to try something different. Indeed, absolutely. Um, and that kind of fits nicely with um, when we talk about employee performance. How do you go about maintaining compassionate leadership when, say, performance of, of the team isn't uh, to, up to the level you would expect? Wow, you know what, um, that remains one of my development areas, so areas where I am growing, um, and I've had a, a quite a, a bit of feedback um, on this, because um, I think in my younger days and previously, I would, I, would, I suppose, I, I was such a, a, a very strong driver of performance, that if you're not performing, or you know the, the department is not performing or whatever within the organization. I'll almost um, dismiss them and uh, sort of in terms of ignore them. So it dismiss them from my attention point of view until they come right. Um, and it's almost like you know you're not playing your part. Go get yourself together and then come back. And and I've learned over the years that actually um, it cannot be that you have someone who is a high performer today. Or reasonable performer and then over time that performance deteriorates. You gotta look in the mirror and say, am I creating the environment for the team to deliver the best? And uh, you also have to take to own it and say, am I supporting enough the, the team? And maybe is there something else that's going on that I might not be aware of? And I think the reality in terms of being compassionate is to first uh, look inward in the sense that we've all had challenges over the years with our performance. I don't think there's anyone who would have worked for two decades or even a decade and have never had a um, period in that where um, they were just not delivering to the level that either the organization is expecting or they themselves in terms of their own trying to expect it. And just reflecting to say, through this journey, there are tough moments. And, and, and what gets you out of that tough moment is sometimes having a supportive uh, boss supportive organization and taking action to help correct it. So I, I, I become, I've become more empathetic in terms of putting myself in the shoe and of, 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 of the individual or the department, have the conversation 
give space and have the conversation and uh, have coaching conversation in particular about trying to generate, get insights about what's, what's going on and then supporting the course correct, correction. Um, because I think, especially right now, uh, I've, I've seen with the pandemic, there's a lot of mental health issues, you know, um, affecting people. Right now, there's been a, a lot, huge losses. People have lost loved ones. People are very much uncertain about their job security. You know, they are very much uncertain spiritually and so on and so forth. That um, it does affect productivity and performance. And you can't just jump in and be demanding in that situation. You've got to be more contextual and, and, and support, support people. And where I cannot, uh, because of my own capability or time, um, or even my own issues, um, then get the professional involved. We have a lot of well-being and wellness organizations. We've got professional coaches uh, just to understand. That said, um, I do think that, of course, you've got to draw the line. You have to support and intervene and give space for cost correction. Um, but if it's a misfit or the, there's no energy anymore and, 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 and it cannot be corrected, then you're gonna have authentic um, uh, um, uh, adult to adult conversation about whether it is in the best interest of both party, parties to, to continue the relationship. And, and I find that those conversations when handled well, uh, and, and with the right level of maturity, you might have an amicable party and the person actually go and be great somewhere else. You know, it's not personal, but, but, but just give the space to have the conversation and show understanding and empathy. Yeah, I think it's interesting because people perform differently in, in different environments. And I remember attending a lecture that Sir Alex Ferguson gave um, and, and he was talking about players um, and one of the questions he, he'd been asked was um, how he dealt with players who were underperforming or not achieving their potential. Um, and he said, look, no manager that he ever knows is in football has ever signed a bad footballer. Um, it's just that sometimes the environment isn't right or sometimes the situation isn't right to allow them to perform. And, and your role as a manager is really to, to work out how we can help them perform and how we can help them perform better and ultimately if they can that's 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 brilliant but equally if they can't you've got to have those difficult conversations um and and move people on because you you, you ultimately need the results that you're, you're trying to achieve yeah yeah no you're absolutely right and i think one of the not so great experiences if you give up on someone too quickly and then they go and work for a competitor and they they are flying and, and they give you a hard time because that's very clear that it, it was about the environment or your leadership style or the, the culture and the organization because the very same person that you had called uh, not adding value in your organization then goes and add value to the competitor and also give you a hard time in the market. And, 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 and those are moments of um, self-reflection to really understand, um, you know, and learn from and grow. So, and then it happens in football as well, where someone is considered an excess to requirement in one football team, and then they get released or sold, and then they go and play for another football team, and suddenly they're a top goal scorer. And you're mm -hmm. like, but how, you know? So, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, who would you say you admire as a leader? Um, and, and, and why? You know, uh, very interestingly, I, I, I've been asked this question before and I, I think my answer surprises people because it's not a business leader. And it's very interesting that you've just talked about um, football because, you know, the leader I really admire is Pep Guardiola. <laughs> you know, um, the football coach of uh, Manchester City. And, and funny enough, I'm not a Manchester City fan. Um, I was a fan of Barcelona and I still am when he was there. Um, my English team is different. But, 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 but really what I, what, I, what I admire about Pep is, um, firstly, is the agility that he has. The, to be able to uh, be great and win in Spanish football, German football, and English football. 
that adaptability in different environments and, and cultures. And, and the second one is he stays the course. Um, I don't believe in leaders who come into the situation, disrupt things, fix things, and then do not stay to see the sustainability of their methods. So if I look at how long he was coach at Barcelona, um, I think about four years um, in Germany, and then now five years or six years in, 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 in Manchester City to show that consistency um, of performance. Because I think it's easy and it happens a lot in business where CEO comes, cut costs, restructure, you know, get some margin up, get the share price up, and then three years they're out. And then someone else comes afterwards and everything crumbled because they were not sustainable. So I think that is, that is, that is very, very simple. But I, but I think the last, the, the, the other one, it's, it's his obsession with winning. You, you can just see the passion, the energy, but he loves winning. Even in losing, he still takes the learning and be clear about, I'm going to try again. I mean, he hasn't, um, many people think he's been great in Manchester um, City because he's won um, the league three times in four years. But, but for him, he's relentless. It's not good enough until he gets the championship. You know, the, the EFA championship. He tried, he tried, and he keeps on trying, and he tries to improve. You can see that that's someone that is self-critical and self-aware and ask people. Um, but lastly, you know, my observation, and I haven't had much criticism from his players in terms of how he manages the individuals and the team. I think there have been one or two uh, players who have complained, but he seems to have a good relationship with his players and, and he, he fosters the team spirit. Um, there were videos of him circulating, him celebrating with the players, how he engages with them in the 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 changing room and so on. Uh, I think at the end of the day, as leaders, we 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 gotta realize that we're only as good as our people deliver results. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, at, at the end of the day, we, we can't do everything in an organization of a thousand, two thousand. You can't do everything. So how you inspire, raise them, and in football, it's very visible. Like I've seen situation where half time. Um, a Manchester United City will be 2-0 down and they come back to win the game 4-2. That, that pep talk, that, that organization, that change, that resilience, uh, I think there's a lot um, that we can learn in business from football managers. Um, and, and I know that um, you're talking about Sir Alex Ferguson, I believe he gives a lot of talks in corporates um, about leadership. And, and, you know, I think for me, it's the same because um, the same way that if consistently you miss your quarterly earnings, so you miss your half year earnings and your annual earnings, you get fired, just like a football coach who doesn't win games. Yeah. You know, it is, it is that intense, you know. And, and you've got and to have the right that. team in place. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so you've got now to have the right I, team in I, place to allow you to deliver, yeah. No, exactly. You've got to have the right team in place and you need to have the right tactics on the day and if the tactics don't work you you adapt them you change them you you can you you at the end of the year you can buy players and uh, release some players that is the same that you can do with your own team and so there's a lot of uh, analogy and how you get the energy going um yeah and and i think i think i think i also like um how he he, he conducts himself and i think it's very important for us it's about you know, self-management self-leadership and um, reputation and governance is such a huge topic right now in leadership, personal conduct. You know, so many people have had challenges with what they do outside of office. You, you cannot separate the two. And, uh, and, and, and really about uh, us being trusted and, uh, and, and, and being inspiring and having the gravitas um, it's also quite important. So how we, we, we manage ourselves. Um, and, and I think on that, Sir Alex Ferguson is just in a class of his own. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn from from leaders of different industries um, and different different spaces. Um, because, it, you know, you don't have to be running a business to be a leader. Yeah. What leadership quality do you think is overrated? Um we often, uh, as, as an executive search firm, obviously we're asked 
to assess individuals all the time. Um, uh, and we often find there are certain characteristics that clients ask for that actually don't impact uh, the business that much. Um, and we have to make them think differently. So what what leadership quality do you think is overrated and, and, and why do you think that? Hmm. I'm going to be controversial here. But I, I really, I mean, basically based on my own learning, uh, over the years, I think sometimes we overplay the role of experience. Uh, you know, people talk about I want 10 years experience in this field, 20 years experience in this field, five years experience in X, Y, Z. I, 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 I think experience continues to be important, but there's enough data points, excuse me, that says that sometimes too much experience can be a liability because you know too much and you do not see when the external environment change and disrupts you so much that your experience in that particular area has become irrelevant. And, and so, so, so I, I, I do think that um, where experience matters is on things like intuition and judgment. Uh, but it shouldn't matter as much in things like industry, uh, because I think the industries um, are becoming converged. You know, um, you know, it, you know, what, what is Tesla? Is it is it really a car or is it a computer? And it, is it a platform? You know, and um, and 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 what what business is Uber in? Um, is it transporting people or is it now actually a logistics company? Or it's actually a marketing media company, and 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 therefore I think I think I think sometimes when we're spending too much time and we've been linear about growth, we're missing out um, on opportunities. So um, I like saying that I think one of the biggest um, uh, entertainment businesses today is Netflix, and um, it wasn't started nor run by the most experienced people in the entertainment industry. And uh, similarly, Facebook is the biggest media company, but it was not started by a media house. And, and how did it get there? And then it's because of imagination. So, so um, I do think that experience, uh, we need to treat experience with um, caution and allow ourselves to get um, the, the youngsters who we can consider to not be experienced enough to challenge us and give us different perspective, especially as the world is digitalizing uh, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Um, so Nimpi, the last question I've got for you is, is one I've started asking recently, and, and, and it's really a question for you. Is there a question that I haven't asked you that you would ask if you were the interviewer? And if so, what is it? <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good um, reflection point. Um, I guess I've, I've answered it in part, um, but there's two things for me thinking out on in terms of what's happening in leadership um, and especially at sort of a CEO level. The two things are the how are we growing as leaders are. Uh, capabilities to lead in diversity. You know, I, I, I think that um, a, a lot of um, businesses certainly continue to have homogeneous type of leadership with the executives being educated in similar kind of business schools and having grown through similar type of career paths with different organizations and so on and being predominantly male you know, and, and therefore that environment is not diverse. Now, as organizations are making declarations, um, around 50% female in executives, 70% female higher, and, and, and the minorities, and so on and so forth. How are we as executives um, really preparing ourselves to lead in diversity? And I think we touched a little bit on that because diversity can also be culture but there's a race, gender, and LGBT, and, and, and how are we actually 
um, getting ready for, for, for that environment so that we create an environment that is inclusive and people can thrive and performance can continue in diversity. That, that is one um, reflection point. But I think the second one for me is, um, is, 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 is stakeholder management, external stakeholder management. How are we growing ourselves to, um, uh, you know, lead the whole? Because a CEO today um, is less corporate and more political as well. So there's a, there was a great article recently in The Economist talking about the political CEO. And, and it's because we, we, we have to impact things like sustainability, um, net zero commitment that companies are making for 2030, 2040, and so on. How do we reduce emissions and decarbonization? And, um, and, and, and we are called to be part of those conversations that changes um, in a big way how we transport our goods, how we package our goods, how we manufacture our goods, how we supply energy into our organization. So how are we becoming bigger and and be more aware of the of the of the of, of, of the bigger agenda um, and and therefore how do we influence that in the political economy? Uh, I think the pandemic has also called for that because many CEOs like in J and J had to make calls about uh, do I sell this as a as a, as a commercial price or do I actually give it away because there's a need? How far? Where? What do I do with my IP? And I think those questions. Uh, will become more and more in how we interact with, with government beyond our corporate affairs and government engagement directors. We will need to actually own it more closely as, as, as CEOs. I, I, I think about that because for me, those two things, the diversity and regulation, talks to the changing challenges uh, of leadership and the evolution of a new generation leader beyond the fact that we are being challenged by digitalization. Absolutely. That makes sense. Uh, Nipini, thank you very much for appearing on the show today. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I hope it was uh, useful. I look forward to seeing it as well. <laughs>